Championship games have a way of transforming the mundane into myth. They make ordinary everyday plays iconic. They turn simple mistakes into catastrophes, minor failures into choke jobs. And of course, they transfigure journeyman role players into heroes who will never be forgotten. Don't believe it? Just ask former NFL linebacker Mike Jones. Oh my God. On January 30th, 2000, Jones made a tackle on Tennessee Titans wide receiver Kevin Dyson, lunging toward and grabbing him around the waist until he was brought down. It is caught by Dyson. Can he get in? No, he cannot. It was a good tackle, maybe even a very good tackle. But if it had come at, say, the 45-yard line in the second quarter of a game in, I don't know, week nine, nobody would remember it. It would have immediately faded from memory, unceremoniously sublimated into one more anonymous statistic in some internet database. But of course, this particular tackle did not come at the 45-yard line in the second quarter of some meaningless game. It came at the one-yard line in the dying seconds of Super Bowl 34, with the St. Louis Rams clinging to a 23-16 lead, and Kevin Dyson trying desperately to scurry into the Rams' end zone and snatch a championship for his team. Mike Jones made the tackle and the Rams have won the Super Bowl. Because of the context, this wasn't just any tackle. It was or is the tackle. A play that many fans and pundits consider one of the greatest, most thrilling plays in the history of the Super Bowl. It's part of NFL lore. When fans are reminisce about it, if they're of a certain age, they talk about where they were when it happened. What's up guys, I'm Joe Biondo and today we present the real story behind Mike Jones and the tackle. Make sure to subscribe to TPS and put your notifications on. We post great videos every single day. Every day is a new video, so make sure you subscribe. Make sure to leave your video ideas in the comments below. We're always fishing through those to find great video ideas. If we take your video, we'll give you a shout out in that video. Of course, one of the most interesting things about the tackle is that it etched the names of two otherwise ordinary NFL players into our collective memory. Mike Jones and Kevin Dyson were not superstars. Over the course of 18 NFL seasons, 12 for Jones and 6 for Dyson, they combined for zero Pro Bowl appearances and zero All-Pro selections. However, a lot of fans still know their names and will never forget their names thanks to one iconic play. So whatever happened to those guys? Where are Mike Jones and Kevin Dyson now? Ironically enough, though the tackle changed their lives in completely opposite ways, today they actually live very similar lives. But we'll get into that in a few minutes. First, let's take a moment to relive one of the most iconic plays in Super Bowl history. If you really want to understand why Mike Jones' tackle was such a big deal, you have to understand its place in the overall narrative of the 1999 NFL season. You see, the St. Louis Rams were not supposed to be in Super Bowl 34. Not before the season, that is. Sure, everybody figured the 99 Rams would be better than the 98 Rams, who went 4-14. Four in the offseason, they landed Marshall Falk in a blockbuster trade with the Colts, then signed free agent quarterback Trent Green, who just enjoyed a breakout season in Washington. The Rams had nowhere to go but up, but then Green blew out his knee in the final game of the 1999 preseason. And the Rams had no choice but to hand the keys to their new-look offense to some undrafted third string nobody had ever heard of. So everybody kind of figured the Rams season was over before it started. However, as it turned out, the guy that nobody had ever heard of, Kurt Warner, he was actually pretty freaking good. So instead of being terrible in 1999, the Rams were suddenly amazing. Warner threw for 4,354 yards and 41 touchdowns. His passer rating was a 109.2. He won the NFL MVP award as a 28-year-old rookie. The Rams offense wasn't all Kurt Warner, though. Marshall Falk rushed for 1,381 yards and caught another 1,048. Then there was Isaac Bruce with 1,165 receiving yards and Torrey Holt in his rookie season with 780. Oh, and let's not forget Hall of Fame Orlando Pace, who made sure Warner and Falk had all the time they needed to do their jobs. Anyway, after scoring just 285 points in 1998, the Rams scored 526 in 1999. 526. The Rams nearly doubled their offensive output from one year to the next. With Warner throwing bombs to lightning fast receivers and Falk blazing his way through and around defensive lines, the Rams were suddenly the most entertaining team in football. The greatest show on turf. It was a Cinderella story unlike any the NFL had ever seen. However, even after playoff wins over Minnesota and Tampa, the Rams needed to win the Super Bowl for their remarkable story to become legend. The Rams' opponent in the big game were the Tennessee Titans. Led by quarterback Steve McNair, RIP, and running back Eddie George, and coached by Mr. 8-8, and Jeff Fisher. The Titans were 13-3 in 1999, same as the Rams. However, everybody knew the Titans were not nearly as good. The Rams outscored their opponents by 284 points. The Titans outscored their opponents by 68 points. The Rams had four players with over 700 yards from scrimmage. The Titans had one. However, everybody knew the Titans were not nearly as good. 
Everybody thought the Rams were hands down the best team in the NFC. The Titans, meanwhile, needed the Music City Miracle just to get past the Buffalo Bills in the wildcard game. As a result of all that, the Rams were seven point favorites heading into Super Bowl 34. A lot of people thought the big game would be yet another big blowout, but those people were wrong. Super Bowl 34 was actually one of the most thrilling Super Bowls of all time. The game started out mostly as expected. The high flying Rams weren't able to get into the end zone in the first half, but Kurt Warner threw for 300 yards and three field goals gave them a 9 0 lead. Then, on their first possession in the third quarter, Kurt Warner finally connected with Torrey Holt for a touchdown. That put the Rams up 16 0 with eight minutes to play in the third quarter. It looked like the Rams were pulling away. But the Titans weren't about to quit. On the ensuing drive, Eddie George and Steve McNair dink and dunk the Titans 66 yards down the field, and George capped the drive with a one-yard touchdown run. After a failed two-point conversion attempt, the score was now 16-6 with 17 seconds left in the third quarter. On the following possession, it was the Tennessee defenders' turn to step up, and step up they did, forcing the greatest show on turf to go three and out. After that, George and McNair once again marched the Titans down the field, and once again George ran the ball into the end zone. This cut the Rams' lead to 16-13 with eight minutes left in the game. Now, all of a sudden, the game was getting good. You practically could feel the Rams tightening up and getting nervous. On the next possession, Jeff Fisher's D made the greatest show on turf go three and out for the second time in a row. All of a sudden, Tennessee had all the momentum. The Titans then kicked a field goal to tie the game 16-16 with just three minutes left in regulation. After the kickoff, the Rams got the ball on their own 27-yard line with two minutes and 12 seconds left in the game. Everybody knew that was plenty of time for the Rams to score. However, as it turned out, it was actually too much time. On the very first play of what was supposed to be the final drive, of the game, Kurt Warner threw a deep pass down the right side to Isaac Bruce, who caught it, evaded three Titan defenders, and took off for the end zone. The 73-yard touchdown gave the Rams a 23-16 lead, but it took just eight seconds off the clock. The Titans thus got the ball back on their own 12-yard line with one minute and 48 seconds left in the game. With time being a precious commodity, the Titans couldn't afford to let Eddie George run the ball anymore. Steve McNair was going to have to throw it. All the Rams really needed was one big play to finish them off. It looked like that play was imminent on a third and five from the Rams' 25-yard line with 22 seconds left in the game. McNair took the snap, dropped back, and couldn't find any receivers. Then two Rams pass rushers started closing in, and McNair had to scramble back to his own 40-yard line. At that point, both Rams defenders got their hands on McNair, and it looked for sure like he was going down. But then, somehow, he escaped. Then he flung a pass to Kevin Dyson, who was brought down at the Rams' 10, with just five seconds left on the clock. The Titans had to come up with another miracle. Now they had one last chance to tie the game, and the Rams had one last chance to save it. Enter Mike Jones and Kevin Dyson. Prior to 1999, Mike Jones had just been an average average NFL linebacker. The guy went undrafted out of the University of Missouri in 1991 and eventually signed with the Oakland Raiders. After four seasons in Oakland, Jones finally established himself as a starter in 1995, but he still wasn't a star. In 1997, Mike Jones signed with the St. Louis Rams and he continued to be a solid but ultimately unremarkable player until 1999. 1999 was a career year for Jones. After recording four interceptions for 36 yards and zero touchdowns during his first eight seasons in the league, Jones recorded four interceptions in 1999 alone, returning them for 96 yards and two touchdowns. Four interceptions, two forced fumbles, two recovered fumbles, and three touchdowns. That's a damn fine season right there. He was a major figure in the Rams' often overlooked defense, which was actually the fourth best in the NFL in 1999. But back to Super Bowl 34. On the final play of the game, the Titans lined up in shotgun formation as Steve McNair took the snap and dropped back to look for a receiver. Mike Jones stayed right in the middle of the field on the Rams' one yard line, just waiting to pounce. Then McNair threw the ball to Kevin Dyson on the five yard line. Like Mike Jones, Kevin Dyson Dyson was not a superstar player. Drafted out of Utah 16th overall in 1998, Dyson was in just his second year as a pro and his first as a starter. While the 24-year-old led the Titans in receiving yards, that wasn't saying a whole lot. McNair threw for just 2,197 yards. Dyson accounted for only 658 of them. Dyson's greatest claim to fame at that point in his career was scoring the wacky, controversial 75-yard touchdown in the AFC wildcard game that became known as a Music City Miracle. Now, here he was again, 24 years old, second year in the NFL with the ball in his hands in the five yard line on the last play of Super Bowl 34. The only thing standing between him and immortality was a journeyman linebacker named Mike Jones. But this time, Dyson wound up on the losing end of glory. After catching the pass from McNair, Kevin Dyson darted to his left in an attempt to evade Mike Jones. He almost succeeded, but Jones dived after Dyson and managed to grab him around the waist, then hung on for dear life until Dyson's knees hit the ground, one yard short of the goal line as the clock expired. There had been a lot of memorable game-winning plays in the history of the Super Bowl to that point, but the tackle was unique. It was the only time a team had won a game on a clutch last second defensive play. And of course, it put the exclamation point on the Rams' unbelievable Cinderella story. Mike Jones' tackle on Kevin Dyson was clearly an above average tackle. 
Was it a great tackle removed from context? Probably not. But a play doesn't have to be technically remarkable to be thrilling. So what about Mike Jones and Kevin Dyson? What happened to them after the tackle and where are they today? Dyson played just four more seasons after Super Bowl 34, retiring in 2003 at the age of 28 with 178 receptions and 2,325 yards. Jones played just three more seasons, retiring in 2002 at the age of 33. He never recorded another interception or touchdown. Today, amazingly, both Mike Jones and Kevin Dyson are working in secondary education. Dyson got a master's in education in 2007 and a PhD in 2018. For a while, he served as a football coach of the Independent High Eagles, just south of Nashville. However, now he's the school's vice principal. As for Mike Jones, he coached college football for six years at Lincoln University in Springfield, Missouri. However, he's had much greater success coaching high school ball. In 2008, he led the Hazelwood Spartans to the Missouri Class 5 State Championship. And in 2017, he was hired to coach the St. Louis University High School Junior Billikens, back in the city where, thanks to the tackle, he'll never have to pay a bar tab as long as he lives. What do you think about Mike Jones' story? Let us know in the comments below. Make sure to follow myself and Total Pro Sports on social media. They post great content every day, and I post pictures of myself and my dog. So go follow us. If you like this video, give us a like. It takes one little click and we really do appreciate it. If it's your first time around TPS, make sure you subscribe to us. We post great sport videos every single day. Once again, thanks for watching. I'm Joe Biondo. I'll see you next time.